Hi, welcome to VC Vibes. This is Thomas Atene's brand new podcast. We are very excited about this. Um, we've been talking for quite a while about starting a forum where we can discuss the kind of work we do and some of the interesting people we meet along the way. Um, so we'll be covering various different topics. We call it VC Vibes, but we are not only into VC. We um, are a corporate commercial law firm based in Cape Town. We've been running for about 14 years now. And yeah, we're just very excited to share some of our adventures with the crowd that listen to us. And yeah, excited to have, have um, guests with us that can inspire us and inspire our client base. Um, today, I'm talking to Paul Barker. He's a very friend of mine and we have known him for about 15 years we were saying earlier yeah. and the exciting thing for me about Paul is that he's not only a friend but he's I've seen him grow in business and I've seen him the kind of roles that he, he plays in businesses and one of the reasons why I thought having him involved is that we've been friends for such a long time but interestingly our business paths haven't crossed that much so um He's, he brings perspective in, in a kind of very fresh way and the things that he has to say I think will be beneficial to our, to our listeners as well. Um, one of the things that I've picked up over the years and in, in the last few years, especially since COVID, is that um, South African businesses have one of the highest failure rates in the world. Um, the stats tell us that five in eight businesses fail within the first year and one of our passion areas of passion as, as, as a law firm is helping clients scale from um, starting their businesses and then scaling through the different life cycles to, to really help them grow through that and help them negotiate the funding rounds, help them scale their businesses, help them attract and keep the right people. And so one of the things that we're really passionate about is helping businesses grow from that position where they have a bunch of friends with amazing ideas but they don't know how to implement it and one of the key uh, reasons for companies failing is the failure to implement and so today I've got Paul with me. Paul is one of the most analytical and um, analytical people that I know. So a few years ago we were planning a trip to South America and we were basically having a dinner together on the Monday evening and three friends we all get excited and we say now we're going to fly to Buenos Aires and then and to take motorcycles and, and, and ride all the way to, to, I think, Peru, what did we say? Oh, somewhere. <laughs> yes, so um, we say that and we get very excited, uh, us and our other friend, and Paul says, hang on guys, how are we actually going to do this? Are we going to uh, like do motorcycle mechanic courses? And he was like, he got into the details of how we're actually going to do it. And that just summarizes and like really emphasizes the person that Paul is which I think really plays into the kind of role that you fulfill and like the kind of work that you do. So maybe uh, as a quick intro to yourself, like um, maybe tell us a little bit about your qualifications and what and sort of your journey in, in business and what brought you to where you are today. Yeah, thank you, Eske, and thanks for having me on. It's a, it's a privilege to be here and to share this with you. Um, I don't think that trip to South America would have happened if you didn't feed me three bottles of wine before we, before we book the tickets. Um, so that's, and I, and I like to think that it's not my analytical brain that came out there, but more my execution brain. Yes, I wanted yes. to know exactly how we're going to do this. Um, uh, yeah, so at back, back then I was um, still studying to become a, an actuary. So that's my background. I um, studied actuarial science. I qualified as an actuary and then I was looking for the next thing in my career. So I um, didn't want to stay in a corporate all my life. Um, and I was looking for what could, what could this potentially mean for me? Where could I go? What are the different op options? I got into management consulting. Back then, um, we were a small consulting firm doing strategy advisory work only. So I work for a company called Step Advisory. Um, and one of the first clients I worked for um, they at some stage had a project to launch um, so a typical CEO has a bunch of different ideas as an entrepreneur and he needs to translate those ideas to the to the organization so we helped him translate the ideas we wrote a business case for him um, he then went to pitch that to his board to raise the or to approve the funding and then he said well I don't have a team to implement this um, so can you help us implement and I took a team of 
for people um, from Step, and we went to launch that that company for him, and it was a kind of an end-to-end -end project. Launched everything from call centers to um, the legal paperwork in the background to marketing and branding paperwork, and okay, just paperwork. <laughs> just get it done. You, just get it done. You, that's what you guys do. Right? Yeah. Um, so uh, we did all of that and then launched the, the company and helped him scale it um, for a while and then handed it back to him. And then actually I did that again with another client, but uh, the, the app part of it only. So in that journey, those two processes kind of got into the, the tech space as well, um, Agile and Scrum and all the rest. And then, um, and then we realized, look, with the strategy background that we have in Step, and those two implementation projects that we ran, we realized there's a gap in the way that the clients think. They think about strategy at a very high level and they think about project man management at a very micro level, but there's a gap in between that they're missing. How okay. do you break down high level strategy into shorter term goals that you can then translate into projects? So they often want to make the jump from strategy to projects. But there's that middle layer, almost the, the execution gap, the gap in the market that um, that clients don't um, typically think about, um, but that's how you translate it into teams. So that's how I arrived at where I am at the moment. Um, currently, we um, I'm still working for Step Advisory and we run a brand called the OKR Group, um, focusing on objectives and key results specifically, which I'm sure we'll touch on in mm. a bit. So I want to know some, a little bit about that because when I follow you on LinkedIn, you talk about OKRs quite a bit and I always pretend to know what it means. So, um, yeah, I want to know, think of that family member at a, at a, at a Sunday lunch after four Chardonnays. I want, to, I want you to meet me on that level. Yeah, she, she asked you after, after four Chardonnays what, what OKRs mean and how, how businesses benefit from that. So... You have to really dumb it down for me on that, le <laughs> on that level so I understand what's going on. Yeah, and then maybe you know, so, you know, explain that to us and how that benefits businesses. Yeah, for sure. Um, so there's a... When, when we... The, the OKR methodology... So OKR stands for objectives and key results. So maybe okay. let, me, let me start with that. So... Um, the, the methodology came from Google, so it was introduced uh, by Andy Grove, who's a, a prolific teacher, so, and ran Intel, um, and he taught it through his uh, management classes at Intel. Okay. One of his, um, the individuals that worked with him was John Dewar, and he was an early stage investor into Google. So, and as an investor, he then took it to, um, to the founders of Google, there were about 10 people at that stage, and they've used it ever since. Now, I've got a few reservations about John Doerr and the way they use it at Google and all of that. But the, the, the point is that um, this methodology got a lot of traction through the, the Google story. Okay. And um, you'll now find, this is now um, 20 years later, you'll find a range of different companies using it. It's not only tech companies, it's also um, retailers use it, Nike uses it, Walmart uses it internationally and then locally um, we've, got a, we've got a range of clients here as well. Um, in short, it stands for objectives and key results. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first met the methodology, I was okay. totally confused. All right. um, but let's break it down into simple language, it's a goal setting methodology. Okay. So when you set goals, you think about uh, what is it that you want to achieve, that's your objective. And then you need to measure what what that looks like. So yes, we can set the goal, but how do we how do we measure what the business would look like or your personal life? What would that look like once you reach that goal? So what is the key results that you want out of it? And specifically key because it's focused on a few things. You can't do everything. So what are the three to five results that you want? And then it's results. It's not plotting your tasks, okay. which is which is very different to a yeah. task management, project management yes. methodology. It's not as dry and it's yeah. maybe <laughs> hopefully a bit more useful. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but but it's also different, right? All right. Because you, because now you you decentralize. So if I tell you go and do X, Y, and Z in terms of tasks, you just need to go and do it. But as soon as we set up an OKR, which is an outcome, and I tell you mm. what, what I want the result to be, yes. or the value to be, or the value to the business, 
then I enable you to go and do it yourself. I enable you to, to figure out what the best solution is. And that's the, the real value of something like OKRs. It's not about setting goals, but it's about enabling te- people, enabling teams, decentralizing uh, leadership and decision making. Is it also about making sure that teams really understand on a deep level why certain goals exist and that the culture really, you don't have a strategy and the culture is something completely different and the culture sort of misses those goals. Is, is that part of it? Yeah, I'd be, I'd be interested to understand what you mean by culture, but, but your, the way that you started that was, was most definitely. So you, if, you, um, if you think about individuals executing their daily tasks at, at work, very few of them can tie it back all the way to the purpose of the organization. So yeah. what am I doing today? How does that tie into what we need to achieve with this quarter? How does that tie into a strategic theme that ties into an ambition that we want to reach over the long term that ultimately ties into my yeah. the purpose statement of the organization? Yes. So that's what that's the link that we want to create. Okay. Um, I think culture is a bit different. So the yes. way that we operate is, is probably a bit different. Yes, it? yes. Yeah, I think... For, for me also, it's important to maybe talk about some of the fundamentals of um, the, the kind of principles that would come across in these discussions so that people maybe understand what are some of the fundamentals that you would typically deal with when you uh, give businesses guidance on the strategy implementation and how, how that would work out for them, like how that would play out. Yeah. Maybe give us some ideas around that. And if there's any anything in the South African market that you've seen as particularly something that we are weak in, um, is, is there something like that? We have a unique flavor where our, you know, the, the areas where we fall short is maybe unique to our South African mm-hmm. business environment. And yeah, how, how have you experienced that? Yeah. yeah so the, um, the, the idea of principles is an interesting one. So okay. we, maybe the wrong one. No, no, the wrong no, question. absolutely. Okay. Right. I love that you referred to that okay. because we always say that the, um, so maybe let me let me take you back to when when we when I ran these two projects for these clients, I then came back into the business. So I was seconded out. So I came back into the business. I'm set with our CEO, and we had these Friday working sessions where we spend hours and hours and hours time trying to digest what makes for successful execution. So and and we um, typical consulting <laughs> project that we that we ran on ourselves, um, and we ended up with ten execution principles. So um, we there's a downloadable document on our website. Okay. We share it um, widely with anyone yeah. who wants it. Interesting to see. Um, and because those are the the principles that underlie any successful methodology. Ultimately, it's not about the methodology. It's about the principles. And if there's there's kind of five categories of principles, so and they form a story. So you start mm-hmm. with strategic direction. You need to create the direction for everyone to go into. Otherwise, they're not aligned. So we need to go in the same direction. Once you have your direction, you need to prioritize. So there's we you can't do everything. Okay. Um, the I think it's David Packard who said, companies die from indigestion, not starvation. So what does they'll, that mean? they'll typically they'll typically want to eat too much as opposed to not take on the opportunity. Oh, so good, got it, yeah. you, you stuff your mouth with all of these opportunities, um, and then and then you don't actually focus on something specific. So prioritize what are the most important things that you need to do. So that's where you go yeah. Yeah. And then the third one is once you prioritize, you communicate. Communication for us is. Um, it's the railways on which a, when an organization is built. Yes. Um, so if you think about any change management mm. methodology framework, um, you which strategy is? Strategy is just a, it's a change that needs to be implemented in an organization. So, and that is based on communication. If you don't communicate, that will, it will fall down. And then you commit. So um, then you keep people accountable, set up the deadlines, run towards those goals, and then the last one is a is around habits, so business habits. How do we how do we run meetings? How do we set goals, etc. So that's kind of the story that it follows: strategic direction, prioritization, uh, communication, 
uh, commitment and habits. Yeah. And those are the principles. And if any, you can run any methodology of those principles, OKR speaks to those principles quite nicely. Okay. But uh, we'd, we'd want to look to the principles and not the, yes. um, okay. not the methodology. You made me realize now when I asked about the, um, the culture earlier, business culture is such a drunk, junk drawer word. Yeah. I think what I meant yeah. is habits. And I think that's a more helpful way okay. to put it. Um, is that the habits that actually either stifle your, your ability to uh, meet your targets or achieve your strategy. And that sometimes, that can sometimes obviously be a bit of a challenge yes. in that, right? Yeah. But I think one of the things that I've seen working with a lot, with some of the businesses that I've worked in and, and worked with is um, the importance of leadership to actually tell people this project that we've been trying to do for a while, we actually need to, it was good. It was good experience doing this. It was it was good that we tried it, but we need to can it now. It's not working. Mm. And I think part of this would be to constantly probably revise or relook at your long term strategy and see, okay, actually this thing that we've been trying for years, this is no longer serving our bigger purpose and the, the end milestone that we're getting at. And yeah, so I can imagine mm. that it's quite important to to also for leadership then to play a massive role in guiding people in that. So you were saying earlier, uh, you know, the habits and how the habits are formed and stuff. But I think at some point leadership really need to, to play that role in guiding people. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if you, if you think about the way that strategy worked 30 mm. years ago, now, yeah. neither of us no, would, I wouldn't know, know <laughs> what it looked like 30 years ago. Strategy was getting <laughs> most mischief and not getting far out. That's probably the, yeah, the primary key strategy. School. Yeah. Yeah, getting out of the house in some way yeah. without your parents knowing. Yeah. Um, the but what I what I hear and what I see is that thirty years ago it was a it was a roadmap that you mapped out. Mm -hmm. So you've got a roadmap for the next ten years, and this is where you want to get to. Whereas um, most people have heard of the VUCA and the volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. So that's the world. All the that acronyms, we, you guys, love your acronyms. <laughs> yes. The more the better. So we um, we we live in that type of world, right? So things change so quickly. So if you try and set up a strategy for the next ten years, it's going to fall flat at some stage. So you need to you need to map out what you think the the world looks like, and that's more that's what we what we see as a strategy okay. in in these days. So like you you map the environment uh, based on external factors, try to figure out what your internal competencies are, um, what is the route that you want to take. And then as soon as you get onto that route, you figure out whether that's the right path or not. Yes. And that's where the part that OKR is helping. Okay. So, okay, yeah. now we know we're on this path, we've hit this milestone. Yes. Um, what is the next milestone that we want to reach? And the path that we originally planned might not get us there. So how do we, how do we change our plans? How do we iterate? Um, yeah. It's a little bit like trying to nail water to the wall because you say probably in any business is the end goal might change and also the way that we get there might also change. Yeah. So it's quite a it's quite a fluid a fluid um, yeah well I'd love, to, goal. I'd love to hear your experience working with um, with startups yes. and with scale ups. Yeah, so yeah. whether that's a reality because we see that and we've we've experienced that. So one of the when you said now you. We don't build um, 10 years in advance anymore. One of the discussions, the startups that we um, see have with investors the most is investors are, especially VC investors, venture capital investors, they, they would always be building with the end in mind. So you build and you build towards that exit one day. So you're not building a company to build a lifestyle business so that you can just earn a salary. You're building towards hopefully um, growing and scaling and selling your business one day and so the the challenge would always be literally from from very early on how we what, are, what is our ultimate goal to exit this company mm -hmm. and a lot, a lot of people think about that very early in the story because investors want them to look at that but then there's a lot that needs to happen from now to get there and i'll share a, uh, in our show notes i'll share a very useful, um, they call it the viral pathway that Village Capital has created. So they've found that a lot of um, investee companies don't really always know what what kind of development goals do we need to set for ourselves before we can before we can attract certain investors. So for example, you might be able to raise funding from family and friends before you've got a minimum viable product, 
but eventually capital firm is not even going to look at you before you are actually showing that you have made some revenue you've addressed you've you've presented your product to the market and that you've actually yeah you've, you've shown that there's a business case for your for your um for your product and that the commercials make sense and that it's scalable and all of that and so i think part of that journey that every single entrepreneur needs to go through is ties in with what you're dis- discussing here because, because i think a lot of the companies that we, as, as I said earlier, that fail might fail as a result of dreaming big on the one side and then not knowing how do we get from where we are today to, to there. So I want to ask you, do you think some of the principles that we discussed here, uh, that, we just, that you've just discussed earlier, would also work and it's also implementable for smaller businesses or do you think it's primarily something that requires a big organization with, with a lot of people that can make it work? Mm. There's so many avenues that we can take or ways that okay. I can answer All right. that because there's a, a, quite a few things that you've mentioned there. Yeah. The, um, Leading questions. <laughs> loaded questions. Yeah, loaded questions. Um, the, the one that sparked the thought was you, you, need, to, you need to converge and then diverge. Yeah. So um, you, you think broadly but execute narrowly. Okay. You you need to consider all of the options and what are what are all the things that we that we can necessarily do, and then and then focus on the two or three things that will progress you in the in the best way. Um, I'm gonna kind of loop back to a question that you asked earlier that I haven't answered was around South Africa specifically and what what's the the difficulty in South Africa and I realized as you you referred to our Argentina trip earlier I realized this on some of my um, travels wherever it was um europe or america but i specifically remember one american trip where um it it struck me how specialized they are and then you come back to south africa and you you realize we're actually a bunch of generalists so we can do so a boer market plan is the, is the Afrikaans saying so we'll 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 take on anything we'll um, and we see that in our own business and mm-hmm. um, because the market is typically smaller so you go to New York and they've got a thousand office a thousand individuals in a in a McKinsey office and in South Africa they thirty or fifty um, people I don't know exactly what the size is but it's but it's significantly smaller so you've got this the opportunity to specialize there yeah you you're much more of a generalist yeah. now um the problem with that is that we don't know how to focus so we we've we we want to look at we want to look at everything we want to um open up ourselves to yes we can do um we can we can meet all our clients demands but but we typically we typically can't so early stage uh, companies uh, fail for that reason so you also mentioned the failure stats earlier so and i think that's one of the biggest reasons is they they're not focused around this is the specific opportunity that we pursue now around your um the the framework that you mentioned that's essentially a goal a goal that you want to pursue at each stage of the, if I understand it. Yeah. Correctly. So what it does, it's, it's a, it's a table. So it's, it's very nice because it's some of these content, this content is sometimes like hundred pages of documents that you have to work for. They've condensed it into, um, literally a table that you can f- use as a company to say, okay, where, where, where do we think we are now? And then it gives you certain milestones against which, which you can map are we actually where we think we, we should be? Mm. And then based on that, what kind of investor would be looking in investing in you? What kind of transaction would they be looking at doing? Mm. Which is, I think, interesting because it also helps people. Um, there's a bit of a overemphasis on funding sometimes in the venture capital in, in tech industry. People focus too much on funding, but it is an important part of scaling. So people need to understand what kind of funding can we get at what, which phase of our of our company and we've often seen people being unrealistic about that so they think they might be able to get investment from venture capital funds for example but they are pre-revenue they've never earned the company hasn't generated any revenue yet and a venture capital firm isn't going to especially in south africa in the us there's a bit of a different um, investment culture around that you could still if you are a rock star and selling your business you might still be able to get VC investment before you your company's 
um, generated any revenue. Basically, just on minimum viable product, uh, VC firms might be interested. In South Africa, there's less of that. And, and so people really need to understand, I think, where they are, what they need to do to get to the next level so that they actually build um, in a strategic, but really exactly. they build the small block. So I th- always think of, uh, if I can use a cycling analogy, uh, people see a guy like Jonas Wenger go killing people in the Tour de France on a big climb and winning the Tour de France and it's one climb but they don't see the years of prepping exactly. everything that got him to that moment everything he said no to so that he's yes for cycling to be that strong so I think for me I've always thought about uh, uh, the, the process of specializing for me is a, is a series of saying no to stuff so that your yes for this one thing can grow stronger and stronger so yeah, for us as a firm, we've also had to do that. We've, we've had to say, okay, our strategy is to be a, a firm that helps entrepreneurs grow, scale, and exit their businesses. So that's quite a narrow focus. We don't do any litigation or anything like that. And I think for some firms, it's difficult because you have to say no to a lot of work to get there. But it does help you become specialized and not only in what you put on your website, but really in your skill set and the kind of deep knowledge that you have about what you do. And you also your, your ability to execute in a way that really distinguishes you as a, as a business, I think mm-hmm. is important. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a very, very difficult, but a very important part of any company's growth mm-hmm. cycle. So what, an, another question I had for you was, um, a lot of what we're discussing now almost seems like you have to strike that balance between being very rigid in your planning, being flexible, but also then staying true to yourself. So how do you find that balance? Do you feel like um, that is something companies struggle with? Because at some point you need to know what are the things that are not working that we can change? How do you make sure that you're not too rigidly stuck on one goal and you might miss an opportunity if you just don't persist and just go for this? Or, you know, you, you have to say to yourself, okay, this thing isn't working out. Like I said earlier, we must actually let it go. How do companies strike that balance and what are some of, some of the sort of ways that you've seen people actually manage that and get that balance right? Is it, is it a bit difficult to... <laughs> that is a, it is a difficult... I don't think there's a right answer yeah. for that because one of, the, one of the things that we say is, is um, a leader's almost one of his most important, the the most important roles of a leader is to prioritize. So ultimately it's the leader that needs to decide, look, this is, this is going to work or it's not going to work. We've got this decision making framework that we borrowed from Andy Grove. Um, If you can imagine an hourglass in your mind at the top of the hourglass is um, the wide perspectives. And um, in order to get to a decision, you need to gather all those perspectives. And then it gets to the narrow part of the hourglass where a decision needs to be made. And often, like sometimes there's consensus on those decisions and sometimes there's no consensus. And then it's a tough decision that needs yeah. to be made by a leader. And you, like, it gets to that narrow point where someone needs to make a call. And then mm-hmm. it goes down the, the um, wide part of the bottom of the hourglass again. And then that leader can go and go on a input and buy in from the rest of the organization again because that's again the role of the leaders to yes. um, rally the troops okay. um, but it's that narrow point where they actually have to make a decision I loved what you said earlier mm. you, you have to say no to a certain amount of things like, and, and that's the tough part because you see opportunities and, and as a, typically entrepreneurs they see, they see more and more opportunities but they have to learn to say no so that you can specialize in those things that you um, that you want to say yes to. I don't know if that did that answer no, the question. question. I think um, we often see often see scenarios where investors say to founders, "You you be busy with too many different things. Um, you we should be able to sell your company or what they call an elevator pitch. What is your one thing that you're busy with? What is the one problem that you're trying to solve? And if you're trying to solve." 40 problems, then you're saying yes to to many things. None of those yeses are going to be strong enough for your company to actually be successful. Um, so yeah, I think it's a it's a massive it's a massive thing. But I, a lot of the things you're talking about is really leadership focused, and I think that's a word that came up a lot today. And it's kind of obvious that this is the kind of stuff that leaders need to drive. 
But one of the things that I can foresee is a bit of a challenge is that um, growing continuity in businesses is, is, is very mm. difficult if people if there's a change of the guard all the time. I think, I think we see that with Apple at the moment. Since Steve Jobs um, is not there anymore, I think there's, it's a difficult to drive that um, sort of goals that the organization set for itself. And I think one of the difficult things is growing something that's strong enough to stand stand apart from the people that drive it so that there's continuity and um, maybe as a departing point from from, mm. from your side what are what are some of the ways that businesses can make sure that these things um, stand out stand outside of the people and like is there technology that you can use is there systems that you can put in place or what are the sort of tools that organizations can use to make sure that implementing these strategies isn't dependent on one person mm. or um, Mm. you know falls flat when that person isn't there anymore yeah we've got a saying technology exacerbates so it it makes the good things better but it makes the bad things worse okay. so if you've got a bad process technology is going to break down that process um, it's not going to fix a bad process so we've got tech partners and we work with some there's it there's definitely benefit in using technology to align on a um, in big organizations specifically but, but technology isn't going to solve a problem. It makes a, a really good process even better. And what you, what you refer to, like the, the thing that comes to mind for me, and, and the, it, it speaks on leadership, it speaks to uh, culture that you mentioned earlier as well, is that we, we think about managing change on three levels. So um, let me mention them and, I, and we can drill into them. Um, it's a, a tool set, a skill set and a mindset. So OKRs is a tool set. So it's a, it like, imagine I give you a drill and um, you and a, a bunch of drill bits and you play around with that drill. Eventually you might figure out how to, to use it. You can, you can read the manual and a lot of people do that. They read the book and they think. words later. <laughs> yes, exactly. You get it right. Um, they, yeah, and you and you'll you'll figure it out. You might not use it perfectly because there's switches and there's um, drill functions and hammer functions and reverse functions and whatever else. No, but if I teach you the skills, you'll you'll get a lot further. Okay. Right? So and that's the the second part that we almost the the it goes a bit deeper. It takes a bit longer to really teach the skills of OKRs and not just give yeah. someone a tool. Yeah. But the, the deeply ingrained one is the mindset. So that's, the, that's what we ultimately want to change. So if we can change the mindset around, let's use the drill example around how you use the drill. And we, we explain to you, look, there's, this, is, this is how it operates and this is how it turns. Then you can fix different things to the, to the, um, to the drill bit and you can use it as a sander and you can use it and we teach you the skills of carpentry and how uh, the grain of a wood works and the way, uh, which direction it runs and all of So that starts to change your mindset around utilizing a drill. And that's the, that's the part that we want to tap into. So as call us, okay, our consultants or implementation partners or whatever, yeah. um, we we you can read a book and start using OKRs. The the real value that we bring is it's trying to shift the mindset within an organization, which that is deeply ingrained. That's the stuff of culture. That's the way people talk to each other. So we've talked about let's say accountability as one of the principles. The OKR methodology holds people accountable. It makes them accountable to each other. Yeah. But accountability is a much deeper conversation that needs to be had within organizations. So do we have a, a culture of accountability where if a team goes for lunch and someone doesn't pitch up, is that right or wrong? Is it so because that's also accountability. Sure. Right? Um, and that it's those are the, the small things. And if you don't address it there, then it like eventually it will fall down even when it comes to OKRs or to strategy or, or whatever else. So and that I believe is a is a long term change. That's where it becomes not just a oh we've got a tool and a bit of technology to manage to manage um, imp implementation yeah, strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we can actually make a long-term difference in this organization. So it sounds to me like, ironically, 
um, your focus is quite narrow because you're, you're an OKR consultant. But if you talk to me about the kind of input you need to give businesses, it's quite broad. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 yeah. the kind of guidance you need to give people is not only on the technology they use, but it's on some of the you know habits and the, the, how you set meetings and um, you know how your, your teams implement it. So it's quite a broad input that you have to give to businesses. So it's um, as you said it. It starts wide and it goes narrow and then it widens again and yes. sounds like that. Yeah. So no, this has been a, I think we're running out of time a little bit, but it was, it was really, really cool chatting to you today. And I think there's a few touch points for me in, in the OKR process to the kind of businesses that we work with. Um, as I said earlier, a lot of companies might re, um, be busy with investment and uh, they've got to set milestones with the investors on how to grow their company to the next level and if there are any businesses like that that need to go through that pr process and granularize the, the goals that they need to set and how they will get there I think your process will be hugely helpful for them so I'll share some of uh, the content that Paul talked about today because um, it's, it's sometimes a, a lot to digest in a conversation but we'll share some documents that Paul has really um, graciously made available to us and just to give you some guidance on the, the, the basics and the fundamentals that we talked about and then we'll also, also share in the show notes some of the, the things that we do as as a company to help um, help startups scale their businesses some of it would be to help you scale into other countries and what are some of the goals and assistance that you would get from us in that process but it's been really good having you with us today and yeah such a privilege to have a chat with a good friend and i yeah, looking forward to doing this again with you yeah i love it thanks so much Stay tuned for more episodes. Uh, if you would like to be a guest on our podcast, that's also something we encourage. Um, we'll try and make these as, as uh, cringe levels as low as possible. Uh, we are a law firm. This is not what we do for a living, but we want to keep these conversations as light and easygoing as possible. So yeah, if, you, if you've got something that you want to chat to us about and think our audience might be interested, uh, always welcome to reach out to us. But otherwise, look forward to um, speaking to you again and have a good one.